My name is Laura Gremmel. I am one of the senior instructional designers at Temple. Um, and we're going to be introducing you to our development process, as well as the strategies that we've implemented in, in, our, in order to ensure success. Um, and first, I want to also apologize that everything is a little smaller than it would normally be. We actually created this project through Storyline. Um, and because the internet is not always 100% um, usable, then we just are hosting it through Storyline rather than um, hosting it on the internet. So um, as you can see here, this is actually our course development process. Um, it kind of looks a little linear, although a lot of things happen simultaneously. Um, once a faculty member is actually assigned to a course, then they, um, at that point, go through our online teaching certificate. Our online te teaching certificate is created much like you see right here uh, through Storyline. It's fully online, um, so it can be done uh, over a long period of time at all different times of the day. All the modules are interactive, as well as um, all, all the modules offer personalized coaching. So while faculty are working through um, the modules, they, uh, they're checking for understanding throughout, as well as they can always contact um, our, our point person for the Storyline project. Um, once faculty uh, complete the online teaching certificate, they are then assigned to an instructional designer, depending on the program that they are working within. Um, that next stage is called our onboarding um, meeting. And what we do is we meet with the faculty. Uh, we've already spoken with our um, other designer who manages the online teacher certificate to uh, just make sure we're aware of how the faculty uh, progress through the program, as well as if they have any experience um, in the online environment or if they're teaching a course that they're just um, kind of rolling over or transitioning into a different structure or really anything in between. Um, in that initial onboarding meeting, one of the first things that we always address with, our, with the faculty that we're working with are the um, goals and learning objectives that either um, are already in place for a previous course that they've taught or something that they're thinking of implementing. And then from there, we move into the program competencies with the program that they're teaching. Um, so we're making sure that all of their content is aligned to what um, is necessary within the program. And from there, we review any content materials. And again, this varies depending on where they are with um, transitioning a course from the past or a complete new development. And from there, we also review our blueprint. And I'm going to um, touch on this in just a few moments in um, more detail. But we kind of walk in this initial stage as well. And then lastly is the flipped classroom. And this is really, really important and kind of all of our methodologies that we work through with faculty. Um, and going back to Bloom's taxonomy and where this all really came from, uh, making sure that faculty, and again, this is something that was addressed in the online teaching certificate, but we want to make sure that um, we, we speak with the faculty about the importance of implementing the flipped classroom in the online structure. So Bloom's taxonomy really um, explains this pretty well with the different hierarchies. So starting with your knowledge and comprehension, these are areas that students will work on in, on in asynchronous, in their asynchronous time, um, so that when they come into the synchronous session, um, whatever day of the week that is, that they're taking that uh, lower level, so the knowledge and comprehension, and applying it into a higher level, synthesizing, analysis, anything like that. Um, so you're really focusing on those those topic areas through the different hierarchies. Um, after that initial onboarding process, or I'm sorry, meeting, we move into the blueprint, which I uh, briefly mentioned. So as you can see here, our, this is really how we're um, demonstrating to faculty how we take you know, what you may have offered in the traditional classroom and the different deliverables that are available now that we're working in this um, highly flipped classroom format with focusing on asynchronous um, content as well as what, how you're going to structure your synchronous time in the um, most effective way possible. So this is an example of our first page of our blueprint. Um, the blueprint is really a high level document that provides us with the ability to work through week by week and work through the different topic areas and how you're going to reach those topic areas with um, supplemental materials and different deliverables for those weeks. 
Uh, one of the first things we always start with, and this goes for a syllabus as well, is the program competencies. Um, starting with that, that highest hierarchy, um, making sure that faculty are working, really the methodology here is a backwards design. So making sure that um, we're focusing on the program competencies to start and then working our way through the course. And as you can see, um, we have our course objectives listed next. And what's really important here is that we link them to the course competence, or I'm sorry, the program competencies um, to make sure that everything is aligning within the course. Um, here we also list the course description, also again to make sure that everything is lining up appropriately. Um, any course materials. And then the last part, which re is really, really important, is the course enrollment numbers. So we, the instructional designers, will check um, the current rosters, how, what the numbers are for that class at hand. Um, the reason this is so important is if a class reaches over 50 students, then the, um, the faculty member has the ability to request an adjunct assistant who is um, really, really involved in the whole process. They are able to offer um, grading, um, supplements, anything like that. They uh, work with faculty on um, communicating with the students, um, having their own office hours, anything, any, really anything the faculty may need. And then the next part is our weekly breakdown of the blueprint. Um, as you can see, this is a collaborative process and we kind of put in here the examples that you would see across any blueprint as we're developing with faculty. Um, so we start with the week and then we move into our topics for that week. We start with the topics, kind of like I said, with this backwards design methodology. Um, we start with the topics so that we can work through and um, discuss the different assets that are needed to reach those topics. So you'll see the next start, the next part is session learning objectives. Um, and if you look closely, and I'm sorry, again, it's really tiny, but you can see that there's, that each learning objective is linked back to the next hierarchy, which in this case is the course objectives. Um, the next part is our videos. So I'll talk about this in more detail in just a few moments, but any videos that we're going to use in the course in order to reach those topics and learning objectives. Um, and then the next part are our readings and assets, again, just to um, make sure that we're reaching all of the learning objectives. And then discussion, deliverables, and assessments. Um, this is really important to make sure that faculty are working through the course in that asynchronous for format, but also um, holding those areas with students accountable so that um, you're actually assessing them on those topic areas so that you're able to prog progress through the course appropriately. And then lastly, our synchronous session um, and how that's broken down. So just as a little background, our the way we line up our courses, they are, some of the online courses, they, um, they are fully online, but they still have a synchronous component. So they'll have a two hour session each week that they need to attend. So everything leading up to that, they're working on readings, um, watching lecture videos, um, participating in discussion boards, anything like that. And then when they come into the synchronous session is when they're working on that higher level thinking skills, such as application, synthesis, analysis, anything like that to make sure that when they move into the next week, everything from the last week was already covered and everyone progressed um, positively. And then the next part, um, which is also really important, and this really provides transparency for the faculty within the blueprint, whereas in the syllabus, that's really for the students. Um, in this section, we make sure that every deliverable that's with, within the course um, is listed within the grade breakdown. And this is crucial for faculty so that they're able to see where the differentiation lies so that you know maybe one of their case studies is weighted too heavily, but because they're working so deeply within each week, they wouldn't really notice that. So we wanna kinda of take a step back and take a look at what, um, how we're breaking down everything in the course. And we just wanna, as instructional designers, we wanna make sure that we're supporting them in that process. And then um, right here you'll see our final exam. Uh, just to kind of mention, we do use Examity for um, our online proctoring service just to protect the integrity in the online session. Um, so after the blueprint is completed, then we move into our content development. Um, and this is taking everything that we discussed in the blueprint and now actually developing it. So that blueprint was just laying everything out. Um, and as I mentioned, were the videos. So we actually develop um, with the faculty online lecture videos, implementing microlearning um, throughout. So we make 
make sure that um, all videos are no longer than 10 minutes, basically five to 10, um, making sure that they are um, short in length so that students aren't kind of looking all over the screen, unsure how to, um, how to work through it, things like that. And as the instructional designers, we make sure to, um, to work with them to build them in the best way possible. Um, something else that we focus on is ADA compliance. So we have created templates, many different iterations, um, and within that, we make sure that ADA compliance is there as well as the parameters for the video studio. So we work, the instructional designers work with um, the faculty to develop these uh, PowerPoints, but we don't actually record them. We have our video development team who uh, works with the faculty at that point. So on the left here, you'll see um, an example of something we may have received. And um, the, oh wait, sorry. And this next slide is how we would have transitioned it. So something that we really always look for is we don't want to take away any of the content that faculty may have built in because it's really important. So we work with them closely to make sure that we're changing it to fulfill their needs as well as um, the needs of the learners. And then this is just an example of our process from slide retrieval until the second that they get into the studio session. Um, so we book them for two different um, appointments, both their studio time as well as a review meeting. And this review meeting is extremely important because we meet with our um, video team who they do all the motion graphics and animation. So we then can um, fit any gaps that potentially there's room for motion graphics. So in order to build re retention as well as really focus on topic areas that may be a little more tough and reach the learners that have just different learning needs. Um, and it makes it a little bit uh, smoother process with those tougher areas. And then, then once they're finished with that, that's when we actually move into the video production and motion graphics. We have a studio um, in-house where faculty are able to record their videos uh, with our um, our video producer. The next part is our motion graphics, and I personally don't make these, I wish I did, um, but they're really awesome. So this, uh, we work with faculty, like I said, during that um, initial editing meeting, or review meeting, and um, we are able to take different, con different content areas, so you just saw it was a survey, and kind of make it into a more visually appealing um, format as well as um, hitting on points that us instructional designers, we may not have thought of, but because the faculty were able to tell us what areas are important, we can then implement that change and those motion graphics. Um, and these are just a few examples of different videos that we have and how we've created them. Um, and the next part, Kathleen is actually going to take you through more steps of our video process and the rest of our development process. Thank you, Laura. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna try and hold this mic and navigate through this <laughs> at the same time, so forgive me. But uh, as soon as the faculty have been able to record their videos, we then send the videos out to 3Play Media for a transcription, so this is for ADA compliance. Um, and once we get the transcription back from 3Play Media, we can associate 3Play with uh, Vimeo, our, our link where we host the videos, and then we can host that on our WordPress site. So our WordPress site we've called the Video Vault, and I'll show this just a minute here. So this is an example of what the Video Vault uh, looks like, and this is where we house all of our videos that we create in the studio. Uh, those outside of Temple University can see our Video Vault if you log on to our website. Um, and you can watch our feature video, but uh, everything else is protected by a uh, TU login. So anyone with a TU login can, uh, and that's Temple University, can log into this site and uh, view all of our videos. Now these are searchable through um, topics, they're searchable through faculty, um, and you can watch the videos and actually search through keywords that are associated with the videos. So um, if a student is looking for a finance video, they can type in something that is related to finance and find the videos that they need to review that material. Um, and also we have uh, the transcription, as you can see, and I'll show a slight video in a minute. Um, but any videos that are related to the video that they search through those keywords will pop up at the end. So um, this is really great for searching purposes for the students and just uh, really refreshing the material that they need. 
So this is an example, and hopefully the volume works here, of how the video will look with our transcription. Hi, I'm Miss Steve Leslie. Thanks for joining me today for transportation. So as you can see, the transcription falls along with what the faculty learning is stating. For today. Um, and, and what's really nice is that the student can download this in a chain. PDF document and um, to compare and characterize taking, the primary uh, mode of transportation. Um, and just use to this to actually search through the videos and skip to a point in the video that they uh, need refresher on or features. need to cover with the material. As a temple supply. So as the faculty are um, working through this video development process, we are also simultaneously taking them through syllabus build. Uh, and we have uh, different syllabus templates for our programs. Um, and this just creates uh, a standardized consistency across the board for our online uh, courses. Uh, we also provide them with this template so that we can include all of the necessary content areas. We constantly reiter reiterate with faculty that um, you know, transparency with your students is really important. That's how they guide them through the online courses. Um, and just providing them with this material uh, before the course starts is really important. So I could talk about the syllabus for a very long time, but I'm going to try and skip through some of this. Um, a lot of this reflects what Laura covered in the blueprint, and we just kind of mirror it here and um, implement this into the document. So this is, again, an iterative process. So the instructional designer will just use Word document, add comments, um, add suggestions of how this will be reflected in an LMS um, and on the online environment. So we can really discuss with them, give them feedback, um, even just a second opinion of how it may be um, viewed in an online content. So um, this is a way of communicating with them uh, virtually. Uh, we also, again, go through the grade breakdown. Um, this can be pulled directly from the blueprint that we had them create. Um, and we can also discuss how this will be reflected on a learning management system. Um, again, necessary content areas that we uh, would like them to cover and um, just to provide tra uh, transparency for the students, uh, it's really important. But one thing that I want to focus on is at the end of every uh, syllabus that we create is the course schedule. So this is reflected from the blueprint um, and we can really lay out how the course will run. Um, and we can also mirror this in our learning management system. So for our learning management system, we, we're currently using Blackboard and we're transitioning into Canvas. So um, I know I talked to a lot of people here who are kind of in the same boat. Um, and what we did was um, try to take our best practices that we've used when building courses in Blackboard and we're trying to reflect that in Canvas. So in Blackboard, um, as you can see here, we set this up in a really specific um, kind of shell template. Um, we reflect exactly what we have in the syllabus in weekly tabs. So as you can see, um, we will provide a to-do list which completely mirrors what we have in the course schedule in the syllabus. Um, and it really takes the student through uh, the course week by week. Um, we also include any supplementary materials that we include in the course. So if we're using Examity, you can see here we have a tab for that. We take the students directly through um, step by step what they will need to do to use this proctoring service. Now, to reflect this in Canvas, we've developed a template for this that is kind of um, going against what the norm seems to be with using modules. Um, we've actually set it up in pages. So this reflects exactly what we did um, in Blackboard with our weekly tabs. Um, we've developed buttons at the bottom of each uh, page that uh, kind of navigates the student through the course. So we have a getting started page where you can include uh, links to the syllabus, um, just a little introductory to the course, and um, you can click week by week and see that we do a similar to-do list as we've done in Blackboard. So um, due Monday um, by 7 p.m., they have to watch these videos, which we link completely out on the pages. Um, and go through the course. Uh, this is just a way of navigating them um, and directing them in a more specific format. Now, once we have uh, gone through uh, building the course in the learning management system, we do uh, an intensive audit process. Um, and this is what we have developed for Blackboard. And we're working to kind of adjust this for Canvas as we learn Canvas. Um, but it's a really detailed um, Excel document where we go over just ensuring that all of the content was 
um, covered in the blueprint, in the syllabus, and in the Blackboard or Canvas site. So we check all links, we check everything that has been included in the site to ensure that everything's working appropriately and the students are navigated through the course um, in an easy format. <laughs> Now, once we have built the course in the learning management system, uh, we also have a team of WebEx specialists, um, and that's what we use for our synchronous uh, sessions. Uh, and our WebEx specialists will actually sit down with the faculty and review WebEx, um, go through the user interface, uh, make sure they're comfortable with the activities that they want to conduct in their synchronous sessions. Uh, so they'll, they'll talk to them about breakout sessions that they want to have, you know, how to implement some activities throughout their courses. And they also work with them uh, on their welcome video. So one thing that we encourage in our courses is to film a welcome video uh, prior to the course, uh, just to create a sense of community, introduce themselves, uh, introduce what should be expected throughout the semester. And this is a great way to uh, share their screen and go over the syllabus prior to the first session. Again, they only have one meeting time a week with the students, so we don't want them lecturing or um, covering this material in the synchronous session, um, and creating a video is a great way to do that. Uh, they can also share their screen and kind of go over the navigation of Canvas um, and how we've set that up just so that the students are familiar with the user interface and can navigate the site um, with ease. Uh, and once they, uh, we get through the course development process, um, that's not where we end with the faculty. We really try to create a continual relationship with them. Um, we provide ongoing support and open door policy, and we actually have consultations with them after the course is run. Um, and we say, you know, what went well? What can we improve on? Um, you know, what did your students say in your evaluations, and how can we change that to uh, improve your courses? So that's all we have. We want to open up the floor for some questions, um, feedback in our format. Um, yeah, we can start over here. Yeah, um, this is cool from Canada. Um, mm -hmm. where Tom, consistent challenges in the space is academic freedom. Can you address a little bit how, how have you, how do your faculty feel about what they would have had, I'm assuming, as being fairly free and what they would have done in their traditional classroom to know online space having to stay between the lanes in terms of student experience consistency program design. Is that something you had to address? Or? So the question um, is <laughs> um, academic freedom and how uh, faculty go about now using their structure and a more templated um, uh, delivery basically. And I, I would say that, you know, it, it depends definitely programmatically. So depending on um, the needs of the program. But I would say that it's not as difficult as it may seem because it's kind of the norm um, across the university and providing examples and showing the different courses. And I think the structure overall, because of this, um, they have synchronous sessions, it aligns very well. Um, and again, these templates that we've created are just guides. Um, you know, there's always the other information the faculty need to provide to students, and they can certainly do that. We would never, ever hinder that from them. A lot of the comments that we leave, we try and encourage, um, we encourage best practices, but um, it's a lot about how you phrase it, and I think a lot of faculty want a second opinion and want some second support. We were just talking about this um, with the comments that we do leave. Uh, so it, it, it's really a case-by-case -case thing, and you have to go into it. And sorry, quick follow-up. The intellectual property, do the faculty own the, these courses, or does the institution the, uh, the question was, do the faculty own um, their work that they put forth? The, the universities? Are, the school. Yeah, the university <laughs> owns it. Um, and as we mentioned with the video vault, um, everything is private on there except for the welcome video, and that is also university owned. So when they sign their contract um, beforehand to teach the course, that is one of the, the, uh, the pieces. Yes? Can I follow up on that? How do you use policy, procedure, and guidelines to draw the line between required and recommended? That's a tricky question. Um, he, asked, <laughs> he asked how we, um, sorry, could you repeat that? It, yeah, I so, just um, want to make sure I phrase it right. Freedom question. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, alluded to there is flexibility, um, and in my experience, you know, everybody wants to know where is that flexibility. Mm -hmm. So, 
how do you use policy, procedure, and guidelines to draw the lines between required, recommended, and do whatever you, you feel? Okay, so we asked how we can draw the line between required, recommended, and you know what is encouraged for the faculty. Um, that, that is a tricky question. Uh, there are certain blurbs that we include in the syllabus um, that are required by the university. So it would be like the academic honesty policy, um, the attendance policy, the accommodations policies. Um, but some of them are kind of flexible. Uh, I don't know if you want to add to that. With, it's, it's really program based as well. So something else that I would add is the course description holds a lot of value. So the course descriptions are set by the university and or by the uh, department chairs. And with that, it kind of lays out the rest of the course nicely because you can work with the faculty and look through it and say, you know, I don't think this really aligns to the course description whatsoever. And if it doesn't, in fact, um, then they can always go back to their department chairs and, I mean, request a change or change their syllabus and how they're developing the course. So in the audit, if there's a, a, a butting of heads at any point, there's an arbitration through the department chair? So the question was if that process happens during the course audit. So it's actually way before. So that would be something that's addressed during the course blueprint um, if it's a new development. If it's not a new development, it would, it, it would be addressed during the syllabus development. Um, but that's because that's when we first pull the course descriptions from the university bulletins. Uh, yes? How long do you allow for course development? The question was how long? The question was how long do we um, allot for course development, which is the best question. Um, it has got, it, ideally it's three months, but we have worked on developments in a week. Um, and it all really depends on how much needs to go into the course. So video development is huge. That is a minimum of a month to two months. Um, you know, depending on if the faculty are local, are they, if we're WebExing together, that's great, but are, do, are they flexible with their schedules? Um, there's a lot that goes into it, and it all, that all depends on all of that. So the question was, our academic schedule, um, it's all different. So there's, we support undergraduate programs as well as graduate from four weeks to six weeks to seven, or to 12 weeks, just full semesters. So it varies. Uh, yes. Sorry. Do you pay faculty for this development time, or is this part of The question was, do we pay faculty? There is a stipend. Mm -hmm. And is it, and do you pay a stipend, like faculty is developing this course and they're going to redevelop it again, or, or are they going to develop a new course? The question was if they redevelop or anything like that moving forward. Um, it really, so with the new development, if it's the next year, I think it has to be approved by uh, the director of the program, depending on what the development is. Um, but all of that is really, that's not really in our hands as the designers. Um, that's more of a con contract and the directors. Some questions over here. Yeah? Yeah, I was just curious, um, like how many teams of people do you have working on one course? Uh, typically it's one instructional designer working with the faculty. So we have um, so instructional designers for each program. So for instance, Laura works in the online MBA program and I work in the online um, OBBA program. So. Um, it, it's really a case-by-case -case thing, but um, we try and have one faculty member with one instructional designer. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm familiar with the video team and then the, uh, mm -hmm. the WebEx team, and it seems like there's a lot of people so he asked, we have different teams within our team. Um, so we say that just because it makes a little bit of sense, but we all work together. So we all are located on the same floor in Temple. Um, and it's actually nice because we have very different um, jobs at hand, but we still come together at some point. So we connect faculty. So usually we start with working with the faculty, and then we connect them with um, our video producers and our WebEx support specialists, all of which we meet every week for a team meeting and everything like that. Uh, yes. Um, it, the course build within the LMS is the instructional designer. Uh, the question was, how many courses does one instructional designer work on? It varies as well depending on the program. Um, it can be anywhere from 10 to 50 <laughs> um, in a semester. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot, but we've streamlined this process very well, so it's just really effective.
Yeah, in the back. Uh, no. So the question was how many are on our team. So right now there's two instructional designers working with the undergrad courses, and that ranges about 50 faculty per, per semester. Um, and then there's three instructional designers working on all of our grad courses. Uh, and the and numbers for that would be... Have, and how many of those other categories are other steps in that process? So there's um, one to two video producers at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, there are two... Uh, su uh, technical support specialists, and then we have three managers. Awesome. Thank you. Well, she said that, sorry, and seven yeah, instructional, instructional designers. designers. Yeah, over here. So what, uh, unless it's completely different from each course, course, what generally goes into these videos versus, uh, I think it sounds like they're sort of lecture videos, and then but a lot of it must go into text instead of audio. So we typically try and stray away from uh, text videos. Uh, and I'm sorry, his question was what content is usually included in the videos that we create. We try to make them lecture videos, and um, we've recently really tried to make them into micro-learning bits, so five to seven minute videos uh, for each lecture. Um, and it really depends on the course. So um, we, we work with them in the blueprint to establish what topics they need to cover um, and what are maybe more of the more difficult co topics that can include uh, animation or should be covered before the class session so that they can reiterate that, this in the synchronous session um, and go over activities and really build on that knowledge. So um, we really work with them in the blueprint to establish what videos will be included. And something to note on that as well is we as Kathleen mentioned, we try and keep it topic-based so that they're not dated. Um, and the reason this is so wonderful is so a faculty member can go into our video vault and browse the different topics that we have, and they can pull videos from different that were potentially developed by other professors and use them within their course. So they really are being used for many different resources. And also, students have the ability to go in, and if they're struggling in statistics, they can go through and look at all the videos that are in there and the different areas that, that it's um, recognizing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, in the middle. We spoke to training for the live sessions, like structuring those, but I'm wondering when campus training occurs. You know, is it the instructional designer doing it in the beginning? Do you have different workshops? Uh, the question was, what's the process of our training for Canvas? Is that correct? Um, so we're doing that right now. Uh, we're creating a Canvas guided course for faculty to work through. Um, we're really taking advantage of the community site. Um, within Canvas, that's wonderful. We're also offering four full day workshops where we're just bringing our laptops and all of the designers and we're going to help the faculty who come with however they may need. Um, and then of course when we have these consultations with faculty, when we're beginning the development process, um, that's really that, I guess that would be that onboarding um, meeting when we really focus on what they have used in the past um, and where they're, where, what they need, what kind of support they need. And again, we're moving in the fall, so we are doing this now. So that's one of the reasons we're attending Canvas, just to learn what other people are doing and getting feedback on that. So, yeah. Uh, on average, about how many videos do you produce per semester throughout the year? That's a tricky question. Um, so on average, per course, we do about 15 to 20 videos, um, and we try to keep it around that range. So depending on how many developments we have um, each semester, it can be a wide range. So. Um, <coughs> To ballpark that, I, I don't but know. But that's if it would, yeah, but that's a good a good yeah. statement. Like 15, mm -hmm, 15 around 20. that per per course. per course. So there could be up to ten developments per semester, and it's really a matter of prioritizing that time and being able to develop that in a short amount of time. The reason I ask is you mentioned that, that you can use other pre-existing videos. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we actually encourage that, and that's why we try and keep these topic-based, so that they can range between courses. So. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Could you, you repeat that? that? I can. Our boss is here, so we'll ask. <laughs> um, the question was, how long have we had our online MBA? Uh, to, since 2009. And was there a follow-up question with that? So uh, he's actually in the room. <laughs> our dean pushed yeah. yeah, our dean wanted it. Yeah, right. Uh, oh, sorry, you're both in. Uh, do you have your 
So we actually try and, he asked if we have our faculty script their videos before studio time. We actually try and discourage the scripting. Um, and we, we go through the videos and try and pull the text um, a lot of people try and put, you know, full paragraphs of text in these slides. We try and pull that up and out of the, um, the PowerPoint slides and say, you know, whatever you say verbally will be transcribed. Um, and then when we bring them into the studio, we really work with our, our video team, works with them to make them feel comfortable and say, you know, this is just like a live lecture. Um, you can do it as many times as you want. If you need to stop, we can edit this. So um, just making them feel comfortable and, and having them go through it many times. And then we have an editing process afterwards. So. Our average studio block time. block time. So we usually do about three hours sessions at a time. Um, we we found that if we extend the time any further than that, they get a little burnout or um, frustrated. So we we do do small sessions um, depending on when they can come in and working with the faculty. Yes. Um, so do you consider the videos and the animations the same thing? Are you making videos and then you're making the animations? So she asked if um, we consider videos and animation the same thing. No, um, the videos are pulling out the lecture topics and we work with them. Um, a majority of that is on the um, topics covered. Um, and then what the review session would be with our video team is to go and like hone in on uh, the difficult topics that are covered in the lecture and we talk about how we can build retention by creating animation in that. So, um, you know, looking at the difficult topics and saying, can we build a chart here that will better emphasize what you're discussing um, and build retention for the students. Yes. During the synchronous meetings, do you have an assistant helping the instructor? Like how big are the meetings? There are there multiple times that are static and allowed for uh, different times of so that was a great question. Um, during our WebEx synchronous sessions, what type of support is being offered? Um, so in every WebEx session, we have a support specialist within the session. So whether that's a student worker or our, our one of the members of our team, um, they are there to assist with breakout sessions, um, any technical issues that may, may come up. Um, it is the internet. <laughs> uh, basically anything at all. And then um, if they have adjunct assistance, they are also there in the class. So they're able to um, jump in and out of breakout sessions and assist with students and anything like that. Uh, yes? Well, we've been, we've been piloting Canvas for the past two years, um, well, one year, um, and we did a heavy pilot this past spring uh, with certain faculty members. So we kind of used them as, hmm? How many? Uh, there was about five uh, faculty members, and we kind of selectively picked a wide range of, um, of faculty that may have a lot of difficulty with Canvas, or maybe they're very tech savvy. So we wanted to implement that just to see, you know, what what this would be like. Um, and also, we wanted these faculty to be kind of um, the emulating courses so that they could discuss this with other faculty members and, um, you know, share their experiences. And they were all positive, so. Yes. So for our synchronous sessions, we're not actually required to um, caption them. Uh, we do have them recorded, and we do post them in the LMS for students to review. Um, but the university policy doesn't require that to be um, captioned. Now, if there is a student who has an accommodation and they have a form for that, that goes to the professor um, weeks before the, the course begins. And then the instructor would reach out to either um, disability services or their instructional designer, and we go from there to get that captioned, um, to have it live captioned. Yeah, in the back. So the question was why we, uh, why we have implemented synchronous sessions. So I think that um, one of the, the main things is that we wanted to transition the face-to-face -face classroom in a smoother process into the online environment. So the one thing that the online environment has been missing was the synchronous session. Um, so to make that more like a traditional face-to-face, -face, they do have that ability now. Um, so you can work on more activity-driven, experiential type work, um, and it just allows for that collaboration between students and the faculty. Yeah. 
I also think that the faculty really uh, enjoy that synchronous session because that's what they're being stripped away of in the live sessions. So they really, um, they really enjoy having that in a weekly session to connect with their students and create that sense of community in the online courses. So I think that we are being kicked out of here. Um, but are either of you interested in moving to Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> well, my boss is right there, yeah. so let's talk later. But please, by all means, we'll be outside if you have any questions at all. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>